Behind me is my 2019 30th Anniversary Edition MX-5 Miata. Now I've owned this car at the time of filming for just less than two years and put over 36,000 miles on it. It's been my daily driver, I've had it on long distance road trips, rallies, track days, as well as spirited back road and mountain drives. So today I want to share with you guys my thoughts and experience about owning this car long term. We'll be looking at all aspects of it including the driving experience, cost of ownership, ergonomics, and material quality. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Assuming you have not driven an Indy before but you have owned uh, other Miata generations or at least driven them, this one is exactly what you would expect, a modern Miata. If you haven't driven a Miata before, you absolutely have to because it's the driving experience that really defines this car and it's unlike virtually every other car on the road. So starting off this video with the driving experience, Mazda has done an incredible job of modernizing this car in pretty much every single way including the interior and exterior design, the technology, the engine construction, and much more, all while retaining the characteristics and traits that we've come to love and expect from the Miata. It's still lightweight, mechanically simple, handles like a dream, and an absolute blast to drive. So before purchasing this ND2, I owned a 1996 M Edition Miata and a 2004 Mazda Speed Miata. I worked for Mazda for a couple years in sales, and after initially driving the ND for the first time, I was amazed at how similar it was to the Miatas that I had before. Obviously, there were tremendous improvements in terms of technology, refinement, and power, but it still felt like a Miata from the moment I sat in it. And for this reason, I actually wasn't planning on upgrading to an ND. Uh, to me, it didn't make sense to spend thousands of dollars for what initially felt like such a similar car but after having the opportunity to purchase this 30th anniversary edition and driving it around as my own for a couple days, my opinion started to change. One of the first things I noticed about the ND after driving it around for a while was the improvement in the chassis. It is way more rigid and stiff than any other Miata generation before. And that's really amazing because it weighs less than the previous generation, the NC, and about the same as a late model NA or NB. The result of this is that the car feels more cohesive. It doesn't feel like it's gonna rattle and twist itself apart when you drive over a bumpy road. It feels much more stable when you're going over bumps and uneven pavement, uh, which definitely leads to a greater sense of confidence and stability while you're driving. And while the stock suspension absorbs and soaks up most bumps in the road, you still get a healthy amount of communication from the road through the chassis, which again leads to that feeling of stability and confidence. And while I mentioned the stock suspension does a good job of soaking up most bumps in the road, it also remains well planted and stable under most driving conditions. There's plenty of grip even from these skinny 205 width tires and the chassis is so balanced and feels very neutral but with a slight tendency towards uh, oversteer which is something that you would expect and desire out of a front engine rear wheel drive lightweight sports car. Now the only time that I feel a little bit of instability in the car is doing quick maneuvers at high speeds or hitting large bumps at high speeds like expansion joints on the highway. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that the stock suspension is pretty soft, but also this car is extremely lightweight, only 2,300 to 2,400 pounds. So it's going to be affected by large bumps much more than a heavier car would uh, going the same speed over the same bump. But despite that, the car still remains very easy to control. It doesn't really want to kick out on you and spin you out at any time. It's still very tame to drive, but it does let you have fun if you know what you're doing. Now, the suspension and chassis are really only two parts of the handling equation. The other one is the steering system. And for the first time on the Miata, Mazda has actually gone to an electric power steering system, just like most other manufacturers are. The benefit of this is that it's very very smooth under all driving conditions. It's quick, it's precise, but it also feels natural. It's not darty, and the weight of the steering system itself is pretty appropriate. It's fairly lightweight. I mean, it is a lightweight car, um, but that is again a benefit because it's very easy to drive on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the only downside to having the electric power steering system is the fact that it really doesn't provide any feedback about what the front tires are doing. The only sort of communication I get from the road does come through the chassis. It doesn't come from the steering system itself. 
I've noticed when I go over bumps, I don't feel it at all through the steering wheel. And this can make it a little bit difficult to control the car when you're at the limits, especially if you hit a bump mid corner and it kind of throws the chassis off a little bit. But overall, this is a pretty minor problem and it's something that I only notice occasionally. I wouldn't say that it ruins the driving experience in any sort of way. Although I think I would still prefer a hydraulic power steering system for the response that it gives. Now, one thing I did to fix this is getting Fly Miata's recommended alignment. Their alignment specs call for more negative camber, positive caster, and a little bit of toe in. The result of this is that the steering system itself does feel a little bit heavier in a good way, and I do get slightly more feedback from the road. It's not quite what you get from some of the older generations of Miata, but it is better than it came from the factory. I've also noticed that with this alignment, the car does seem to handle a bit better. It seems to have more grip and the whole car does feel more stable as well. So I would highly recommend getting this alignment if you have one of these cars and you like to drive it on fast roads. Overall though, Mazda did a great job of providing a quick ratio steering that feels very natural and it contributes to this car's lively and playful handling characteristics and really makes it easy and fun to toss in and out of corners. So yes, while the handling is phenomenal, it's still one of the hallmark characteristics of the Miata, and it makes it so much fun to drive this car on track or a twisty back road. I think one of the best parts about this car is actually the engine. Now when the ND first debuted for 2016, Mazda put the 2.0 liter inline four from the Mazda 3 directly into the Miata. However, for 2019, as most of you probably know, Mazda introduced a completely reworked version of that engine for this car and I have to say it's the best engine the Miata has ever had and probably has to be one of the best road going naturally aspirated four cylinders ever made. Like I mentioned they completely reworked this engine for 2019. It has lighter rods and pistons, a rebalanced crankshaft, it also has larger intake and exhaust valves and ports, a larger throttle body, and a revised air intake manifold. All of these changes have resulted in more horsepower, more torque, and a higher redline, now 7,500 RPMs. Not only are the specifications better on this engine, but the new one has so much more character than the old engine does. Now, don't get me wrong, the old engine was fine, but this new one just feels so much more lively and eager. It revs out easier and better than ever before and feels smoother and sounds better in the process. Just listen to it. <laughs> now granted I do have the Goodwin racing exhaust it sounds all right uh, with the stock exhaust but you just put a muffler on there and my god does this engine sound amazing this engine also pulls all the way to redline unlike the old engine did and it's satisfying and thrilling to drive and drive hard in a way that again the old engine just wasn't and the beautiful thing about it is that Mazda has somehow managed to take a small four-cylinder naturally aspirated engine not only have top-end power but it also has a decent amount of mid-range torque depending on what gear you're in you can come out of corners at as low as maybe 3,000 rpms and still have enough power on tap this engine definitely contributes to the ease with which you can daily drive the car but also makes it so much fun on a twisty back road or taking it out to the track and really pushing it to the limits. Now with this new engine came another change for the car and that is the switch from a single mass flywheel to a dual mass flywheel. Now Mazda claims that they added the dual mass flywheel for the 2019 and newer Miatas to help cope with vibrations from the higher red line. I think this also might have been a decision because the early ND ones, especially the 2016 model year, did have some issues issues with uh, transmission failures and so having the dual mass flywheel to absorb some of those vibrations from the engine should definitely help with the reliability of the transmission and so far that seems to have paid off. I haven't had any issues with my transmission despite tracking the car and driving it hard on back roads and I haven't seen the issues with the ND2s that I have with the ND1s. Really the only downside to adding the dual mass flywheel is it's not quite as responsive to rev changes when you blip the throttle. Despite Mazda saying that the moment of inertia of this new dual mass flywheel is the same as the single mass, 
it really doesn't seem to uh, rev up as quickly when you hit the throttle as the ND1 did. Now it's not a major issue as this engine doesn't seem to lag when you hit the throttle and doesn't take a long time to rev up. It's still very eager and playful. I mean, it's very easy to blip it up when you're downshifting, but it is a noticeable difference from the ND1. However, the benefits of the dual mass flywheel is that clutch engagement is way smoother. I mean, whether you're starting off from a stop or you're just shifting gears, the clutch engagement is way smoother than it was before, especially if you don't rev match the engine perfectly. There's no real bucking or jerking back and forth if you don't get that rev match perfectly smooth. It does make sense why they added the dual mass flywheel. I don't think it really takes away from the fun of this car, uh, but does add some nice refinement, especially as most people do tend to daily drive these vehicles. Another thing to mention quickly about the driving experience is the shifter. For one, it's very direct. It's connected right to the transmission. There's no cables or linkage. So you have a very direct feeling and Mazda included a short throw shifter from the factory for this car, which is super awesome. So you know exactly what gear you're going into. It's very satisfying to go from one gear to the next. Um, the only thing I would say about it is that the synchros don't seem to be the best. This transmission does have a notchy shifter feeling and that is by design, but sometimes it feels so notchy to the fact that it seems like the synchros aren't quite uh, doing their job and lining up the gears very well, which may not be the case, but that's just the feeling that you get sometimes when you shift the car. Other than that, it's perfect. And I think the transmission uh, gear ratios are amazing in this car as well. The RPMs sit a lot lower than previous generations for highway driving, which makes this car a lot better as a daily driver. Now, the first five gear ratios feel about the same as they did in the old five speeds from the NA and the NB, with the sixth gear in this car being lower RPMs for cruising on the highway. Now it sits at about 3,300 RPMs at 80 miles an hour as opposed to 4,000, which does make a noticeable difference while highway driving. And all of the gear ratios in between are pretty much perfect to take advantage of the power curve of this engine. They don't feel too close or too widely spaced apart. And then your other driving controls, we talked about the steering already, but the pedals, the clutch, the brake, the gas, they all feel very natural. I love the placement of them. It's very easy uh, to put your feet on the pedals. They're not too closely spaced or anything. And the throttle, while it is electronic, is very responsive and feels natural. The brakes are very linear and progressive. They're not like an on-off switch in some cars nowadays. And the clutch is very linear as well. It has a short travel to it, um, but it's very light, easy to daily drive in that regard. And you actually do get a little bit of feeling from the clutch pedal. You can tell where that bite point is. Is. So I think Mazda did a perfect job with all the inputs in this car. You still feel very connected to the car because of that. So while the driving experience is as fun and special as ever, and it does help contribute to the more modern feeling that this ND Miata has, I think Mazda also nailed the interior and exterior design with this car. The ND debuted for a 2016 model year, so it's going into its seventh year as a production car, and to me, it still looks like a brand new design. It is a bit of a departure from the previous Miatas. Those are more innocent and cute looking, while this one has a more aggressive, angry look, especially at the front end. But I love what they did with the design. I think it suits the nature of this car very well, and again, makes it look more modern. I love the angry headlights. I love the creases on the hood up near the fender. I think all the body lines flow seamlessly together. It's iconic, it's unique, it's recognizable. It's really a beautiful and timeless design in my opinion. Still looks like a classic Roadster. And especially with this orange color for the 30th anniversary edition, it looks kind of exotic. And I've gotten a lot of uh, compliments and head turns from driving this car around. And this is the first time that Mazda used their new Kodo design language on the Miata. And again, I think they just absolutely killed it. Design wise, I think there's only two things I wish Mazda would change about the look of the Miata. And the first one has to do with the brake calipers. Now this is only specific to if your car had the Brembo uh, performance brake package, because of course you get the Brembo front brakes and then on the rear you get what's pretty much the standard caliper, but they do paint it. Uh, however, what they don't paint is the bracket right there. 
And I think it would look so much better if they painted that as well to match the caliper uh, versus just leaving that like unpainted metal. It kind of looks like an unfinished job in my opinion. Now the second thing I wish they would change is the door right here. While I think it's a very beautiful design, especially because of the way this curve is here on the back side, it creates a problem where when you open the door, you can see that the actual door pretty much ends here or maybe even here but then because of that curve, it extends out another three, four, five inches or more. And that creates a problem because it's a long door to begin with. All two door coupes are pretty much like this. And you can see how much further it sticks out than this parking line when you have the door fully opened. And let's say if you had another car parked here and they get close to the line, you can only open it this much. Well, then it makes it a little bit difficult to get in the car, especially if you had the top up, maybe the window up. You really have to uh, contort yourself to try and get in the car there. So that's one thing I wish they would change because if they didn't have this piece here, you could definitely open the door a little bit wider and that would be a much more usable design. But now stepping into the interior of this car, Mazda created an elegant and simple interior that is very unique and fitting to this car. I love how the top of the door panels here are body colored. They bring a pop of color into the interior and it makes it look like that hard line that goes from the hood extends all the way into the interior here. I love what they did with that piece of design. And now for the most part, ergonomics in here are pretty good as well. The car overall is a little bit shorter inside than some of the previous generation Miatas, especially on the passenger side because they do put the uh, subwoofer for the Bose sound system down there in the passenger footwell. But the driver's side still has plenty of leg room now the pedals as well, I do love how they added a top mount uh, gas pedal. To me, that makes it a lot more comfortable when driving compared to a top mounted gas pedal. It feels much more natural and easy to keep your foot there, uh, especially on long highway drives. Also, the pedals are very appropriately spaced. I wear a size 11 shoe and I can heel toe downshift in this car just fine. Plus they still managed to have room for a dead pedal. So they did a great job of adding a lot of space between the pedals, uh, but everything just feels like it was designed for the driver. And I really love what they did here. Also elbow room. This car does seem a little bit wider than some of the previous generations, probably about the same as an NC. And then with the top up, I actually do have a surprising amount of headroom, maybe about an inch or so. And again, I'm 6'2", so it's surprising how much room there is in this car. Now, the soft top does provide more headroom than the RF because the metal roof on the RF is a bit thicker. So if you are a taller driver, that's something to consider. You might want to go with a soft top. In addition, you might want to get these Recaro seats as well because I do feel like they sit a hair lower in the car as opposed to the standard seats. They're also a lot more comfortable in my opinion. The standard seats have a much more narrow shoulder, so it actually kind of digs into my back a little bit on the standard seats. Plus the extra bolstering in here really helps hold you in on track or a twisty back road, and they're not difficult to get in and out of. You feel like you're actually sitting in a bucket seat and you're sitting in the car, not on top of it like you do in the standard seats and some of the previous generations of Miatas. So if you have the opportunity, I would definitely go for these Recaro seats, and they just look absolutely beautiful. Just look at that with the suede and then the leather on the side. These are beautiful, beautiful seats. Now, one thing Mazda did thankfully change for the 2019 model year is they finally introduced a telescoping steering wheel. And all of us taller drivers out there are very thankful for this. Let me show you why. So in a lot of the other Miatas, the steering wheel was just right up on the dash. And for us taller drivers, that creates a problem with our knees here. You can see as I use the clutch pedal, my knee actually hits the steering wheel. Same thing if I try to lift off the brake to move my foot over to the gas. But with the steering wheel pulled all the way out, I don't have that problem at all. If you're a taller driver, you might want to go for a 2019 or newer because of this feature among some of the others. All of your other controls are also exactly where you expect them to be. The shifter is in a great location. It's pretty much where your arm and hand naturally rest. Super easy to throw through all of the gears. Same thing with the e-brake. You're not having to reach for it very far. It's right there. Climate controls right here at your fingertips. You got three dials, super simple, heated seats. The screen up on top of the dash, which when I was working at Mazda, I had a few people complain about the location of this. You know, they say they didn't like the look of the screen say on top of the dash. Personally, I don't mind it at all. I think it, again, helps the Miata look a lot more modern by having this screen here on top of the dash. I think it looks good, but more importantly, it's more practical than having the screen lower in the dash. Reason for this is with the screen up here higher, you only have to 
glance at the screen as opposed to taking your eyes further off the road if it were down here. So it really does reduce distractions. It helps you keep your eyes on the road a lot better. In addition, the screen does get very bright if you want it to, and I've never had issues with it being washed out by the sun, even with the top down on a bright sunny floor today. Other controls like your steering wheel controls, super simple, logically laid out. You got your wiper stock, headlights, traction control off and lane departure warning off. And then of course the window switches, door locks and power mirror controls. Everything is just logically, intuitively laid out. And again, it's a very simple cabin. There's not a bunch of buttons littered around. Everything has a purpose and it's right where you expect it to be. Also, I love the design of the cup holders in this car. You can see they're both here between the seats. So of course that can make it a little bit difficult to reach your drink, but the beautiful thing is these cup holders are configurable. So you can take this passenger side one, pull it straight out here, place it right in the hole there, and then you have an easy to reach cup holder for the driver there. And it does not intrude on the leg room of the passenger very much either. So you could have a passenger here, they can sit quite comfortably and you can still use this cup holder and then they have one for themselves here. Of course, if they don't want the cup holder in their knees, you can always take it and move it here. Or if you want more room for your elbows, you can take them both out, which is super cool. So they are configurable and I think that's great that Mazda went with this design because let's face it, there's not a lot of good places to put cup holders in a two seat sports car, especially one with a manual transmission. So I think Mazda did a great job with this design here. Now let's talk infotainment system for a moment. This head unit in the ND is a lot different than previous Miatas and probably a lot different than other vehicles that you have driven. It is very similar to BMW's iDrive system in the sense that it has this large rotary dial here to control what's on the screen. You have a couple of buttons surrounding it to get you to your main functions like your music, home menu, navigation, back button, and then favorites, as well as a volume knob right here. Plus you have some controls for it on the steering wheel. Now this is a touch screen, but only when you're traveling below five miles per hour. Above that, the touch screen function is locked out, which personally I don't mind because I love having the physical controls. There is a little bit of a learning curve to them if you've never used a system like this before, but the user interface for this system is very clean, it's very simple, it's easy to understand. So if you play around with it for a few minutes and familiarize yourself with it, you will learn where everything's at and you develop muscle memory with these buttons so you don't have to look at the screen to move around the menus and select things. And I love the physical feedback they provide compared to a touch screen. Plus, you're not gonna be getting fingerprints all over your screen. The only issue I do have with it is that sometimes it can be quite laggy let me show you, I can go over to the settings here and then it is a little bit slow to move through the menus. I'm toggling this dial a bunch of times and you can see how it doesn't move through super quick. It's actually doing a surprisingly good job here, of course, for the camera. But sometimes while you're driving, it can be slow to move from one menu to the other. And then especially on startup, I've noticed the system is very slow uh, to initially respond. If it's a cold start, let's say you haven't driven the car yet that day. It usually takes me about 30 seconds or so before I'm actually able to use the system. So that's something that I hope Mazda uh, continues to develop in the future and maybe add their newest infotainment system onto the Miata. Now, of course, not everything is perfect, and I do have really two problems with the interior of the ND Miata. The first one is these armrests on the doors. You can see just how thin they are, and they actually slope downwards a little bit as well. So the problem is if you put your elbow here, it tends to just want to fall off. And you can clearly see there's a lot of room here where Mazda could have extended this door panel and given you a much better armrest, but they didn't. The other thing is the foam is quite thin and it's not very supportive. So if you do leave your arm here for an extended period of time, your elbow does start to get quite uncomfortable after maybe an hour or so on a road trip. And then because of how small it is, you kind of have to brace it against the door panel and maybe against the steering wheel as well. So that's definitely something that Mazda should change in the future. The other issue with the interior is the lack of storage space. I know that sounds funny because it is a two seat sports car, but they really could have done better. I was talking about the door cards and how small the armrest is. And that kind of ties into the fact that there's no door pockets on these door panels at all. There's not one there on the passenger side and nothing here on the driver's side. And again, you can see they had a lot more room to extend this door panel out. They could have given you a pocket to store your phone or something like that, but they didn't. There's also no glove box either. 
All you have for glove box storage is this little locking box between the seats here. Now you can see it is pretty deep in there. You can actually fit quite a bit of stuff, which is nice. And it does lock with the key, but this is really the only usable storage space here in the interior where you can actually put away items. They do have this one here, but it's quite small. In fact, my phone can't even fit inside. It, it just doesn't fit. It's good for pens, some paper, coins, maybe that but I usually put my phone up here in this cubby, so it is nice that they added this cubby, and I guess this can add a few things here, but really this is the only, again, usable storage space in the car. There is, behind the seats, a little pocket here, and then if you have the soft top, there's an additional one behind the driver's seat as well, but since you have to fold the seat forward to get to it, it's not really easily accessible storage. So I don't really use these for much of anything except for my owner's manual. So those are the two problems I have with the interior, the lack of storage space and the really tiny armrests on the door panels. But besides that, everything in here is phenomenal. I love the fit and finish of the interior. I think it's really elegant and beautiful and Mazda did a great job with the design of this interior. I've gotten a lot of compliments on it from other people who have sat inside or seen the car and they've said that it seems like an interior that would be in a much more expensive car. So kudos to Mazda for that. I think partially is some of the materials they use. Now, the suede here on the dash and the doors is specific to the 30th anniversary Miata, but it does look really, really nice. While the interior storage space isn't that great, I think Mazda actually did a really good job with the trunk space in this car. It's a lot deeper than the other Miatas, so you can fit taller bags in here. And while it is an odd shape, if you use soft suitcases or duffel bags or backpacks, you'd be surprised at some of the stuff that you could fit in here. The only issue is the opening here is quite small. I think it's smaller than any of the other Miatas. But again, if you use soft shell suitcases, duffel bags, backpacks, things like that, you could definitely fit a lot of stuff back here. One other thing to mention is that the Miata does not come with a spare tire anymore. I don't believe the NC did and the ND does not either. All you get is this fix a flat kit right here. Other things I've noticed about this car after owning it a while and the ND as a whole is the reliability and the material quality. Now reliability has always been a hallmark characteristic of the Miata. They've known to be reliable since they were first introduced and the ND is really no different. I drive this car very hard. I've taken it to the track multiple times. I'm definitely not easy with it, but it's never left me stranded or broken down. It doesn't seem to burn any oil or have any weird issues. So from a reliability standpoint, it's awesome. The only issue I did have was an air conditioning hard line ended up breaking on me about 16,000 miles or so on the car. This is a problem with the Indies, at least earlier model years. Mazda even put out a technical service bulletin about that problem, and I was able to get it fixed without any hassle under warranty. So that wasn't a huge issue, and it didn't affect the drivability of the car. The other issue that these cars tend to have, which I touched on earlier, but thankfully hasn't happened to mine, and doesn't seem to be apparent is transmission failures. This was a problem on the earlier ones, especially the 2016s, but Mazda has gone through several different revisions of the transmission. And of course, adding a dual mass flywheel, they seem to have fixed the problem. But in case it does happen to you, don't worry. Mazda has done a very good job from what I've seen of replacing those transmissions under warranty. I've heard of some people getting three of them replaced under warranty. They track their car or take it to autocross all the time. And thankfully Mazda doesn't disclude you from getting that replaced under warranty because you track the car. They've said that that's what the car is designed for. It should be able to withstand it. So I'll give them credit that while they do have that issue on some of these cars, they've done a good job of trying to fix it and rectify the problem. Besides those two issues, the overall reliability of this car is awesome. However, I feel that the material quality of the car really isn't. On the outside, the paint, it just doesn't seem to be very durable. Now this car is very low, so of course it's going to get hit by rocks and debris and stuff more often than most other cars, but I have seen several uh, detailing shops and body shops that have measured the paint because they're going to do a paint correction, and they've said that it is incredibly thin, can only be cut or buffed maybe one time, and not only is it thin, but it seems to be very fragile as well. Rock chips, I get an absolute ton of them on this car. Again, that's probably mostly because of how low it is, but I have seen rock chipping issues on other Mazdas as well. I got my first rock chip within two days of ownership on the front bumper. It went all the way through the paint to the plastic beneath, and then I've got a bunch more now on the hood, the fenders, even one on the A-pillar where they've just gone all the way through the paint. There's nothing left. 
So it's kind of disappointing that the paint quality doesn't seem to be great and that doesn't seem like an item that's going to last long. So I would definitely recommend getting a paint protective film if you do get one of these cars brand new and want to keep it looking new on the outside for as long as possible. On the inside of the car, I do like the materials that Mazda has made. It feels like a very nice place to sit, but some of the things like the leather especially just doesn't seem to be very durable. The shift knob of mine already has a lot of peeling on it. I did swap out the steering wheel, but I've seen a lot of stock steering wheels have a lot of leather peeling and ripping on them. E-brake handles, I've seen tons of those getting worn down, which it is an item that you use almost every day, but you're not really putting a lot of wear on the handle itself. And then the seats as well, the leather overall just seems to be very thin and very brittle. I've seen some people have issues with tearing and rips as low as you know a couple thousand miles on the car. Thankfully, mine has held up pretty well so far. I do try to take good care of it, uh, but I do see a small tear, I think, in the bolstering of my driver's side seat. So that is an issue that I have found with this car and does make me question the durability of all the other materials long term. So if you are looking to own one of these cars long term, I would suggest taking a little bit extra care when you're getting in and out of the car, making sure you put leather conditioner on it, and just do all the things that you normally should do to try and take care of it and make it look new for as long as possible. Now, as far as running costs go, the Miata is so cheap to own, and that's a massive benefit to this platform. Insurance is really no different than any other typical commuter car, and while this one does take premium gas, the gas mileage is amazing. When I lived in Orlando, I'd usually get about 26 to 28 of pure city driving and then on the highway I've gotten as much as 36 to 39 mpg so again while it takes premium gas the gas mileage is so good you don't really care even while having fun with this car and pushing it to the limits I don't think I've ever gotten worse than about 20 or 22 miles per gallon and that was with fast twisty back road mountain driving now maintenance is a breeze as well for anybody that's worked on Miata, you know that they are super easy to work on. Everything is small, lightweight, and simple. You don't need any specialty tools, and the ND is the exact same way. Everything's accessible on it. It's all 10, 12 millimeter bolts, so it's super easy to work on. Parts are relatively cheap considering that it is a sports car. And for example, oil changes. This thing only takes four and a half quarts of oil and uses a very small filter as well, so it's really not an expensive car to own. I would say the running costs, especially given that it is a fun sports car, have been very low and well worth it for owning a car like this. Now, a little while ago, I did post something on my channel asking people if they had any questions about this car. I did get a couple responses, so I want to answer those here in this video. The first question was, would you keep your ND2 if the ND3 were to debut? And I think that depends on what changes, if any, Mazda makes. We don't really know if there even will be an ND3, so it is hard to say. Uh, but this one here that I'm seeing in is quite special, the 30th anniversary edition with the color, the materials, different features that it has that you can't get on a normal Miata. It would be a very hard vehicle to get rid of, so they would have to make some pretty significant changes for an ND3, and I would have to get a really good value out of this one to consider upgrading to an ND3. Regardless though, I'm super excited to see what the next generation of the Miata has in store. Now the second question I got was, what mods have you done and why do you think they were needed? Let me start by saying that I don't think any mods are really necessary on this car. I have done a lot to mine, but I think these cars are perfectly fine as is. They're a blast to drive, and of course, anytime you mod your car, you do inherit the uh, probability of something breaking or going wrong because of what you've touched. So I don't think mods are really necessary on the Miata. But if you do like to modify your car and really build it to suit your individual tastes, the aftermarket options are plentiful for this platform. I've done quite a few things to mine. The first thing I did was the Goodwin Racing Race Muffler. I did that because personally, I was not a huge fan of the stock exhaust. It just didn't sound sporty enough to me. So I threw the Goodwin Muffler on there and now it sounds amazing. It doesn't drone on the highway. It's not too loud. I think it's perfect and fits this car very, very well. I do have plans to do more with the exhaust in the future, as along with an engine tune to try and get more power, hopefully 200 wheel horsepower, but that will be probably much later down the road. And of course, I'll include that in future videos. As far as the suspension goes, I have done a few things there. I have Olin coilovers and Ibox sway bars. These were done to not only improve the handling and tame the ridiculous amount of body roll that these cars have from the factory, but also to lower the car as well. I think the Miata sits way too high from the factory 
and the handling has been massively improved with this suspension. Now, of course, ride quality has suffered a bit from doing those suspension mods, but I think the trade-off in the handling, how improved it is, I've got way more grip, the car handles mid-corner bumps much better, and feels much more stable as well. Those improvements were well worth it to me to change out the suspension from the factory to this one. Now, I also added garage line wheel spacers, 20 millimeter front and 25 millimeter back. This was purely for aesthetics. I like the flush uh, fitment of the wheels with the fenders. So that was just for looks. I don't think it really provides any sort of performance improvement. I just like the looks of it. Underneath the car, I've added the entire Virus Engineering underbody panels and rear diffuser. These were done because I noticed this car with how light it is, it does seem to get a little bit floaty at very high speeds. It seems like it has a little bit of lift to it. So I added those panels and the diffuser to help combat that and hopefully give this car more downforce, which has seemed to work. The car feels a bit more stable and glued to the road at high speeds. And also I've noticed I get marginally better gas mileage having better aerodynamics under the car. So that's why I installed those. On the outside, I swapped all of the incandescent light bulbs for LEDs and added the rear LED strip light by MX-5 things. I did that to just improve the look of the car. I don't think the incandescents belong, especially on a car that looks as modern and good as this one. So the LEDs really improve the aesthetics and hopefully I'll never have to change those bulbs ever again because LEDs last a long time. Inside the car, I also swapped out the dome light here for an LED because it's a lot brighter than the stock incandescent bulb. And I also swapped out the steering wheel because I think that the standard Mazda wheel is just, it's too thin and generic. It's basically the same as every other Mazda vehicle, except it's a little bit thinner of a rim. So I got this one, which has a thicker rim to it. It's also contoured, unlike the factory wheel. So your grip while you're driving on the wheel is a lot better. And aesthetically, I think it looks a lot nicer than the stock wheel does. So that's all that I have done with the car right now. I definitely have plans for adding more modifications in the future. And I'll make sure to create videos and upload them here as they happen. Now, another thing I wanna talk about briefly as far as the driving experience goes, and I had to put the top up for this, is the ambient road noise in this car. I think it's much improved over previous generations. The RF, of course, is going to be a little bit quieter than the soft top, but depending on what trim level you get and what model you're, the soft top, at least mine, has two layers on it. So you definitely get a lot less wind noise through the top. And overall, I think the interior in here is a lot quieter than it has been in previous years. I'm doing about 50 miles an hour right now, and it's very easy to talk into the microphone or talk and listen to a passenger or hear your music. In fact, with the music turned up, especially if you have the Bose system, which by the way, way better than the standard four speaker system in the sport model, you really don't hear much of the external noise at all. And with the top down and the music up, you can clearly hear your music through the speakers. So I think that's another benefit as far as the daily drivability of this car goes, is that the ambient noise is not as loud as it used to be. So if you're looking for a car that's fun and engaging to drive, while also being reliable and easy to maintain and relatively cost effective, the Miata is still the answer. It's just so satisfying and fun to drive in a way that many other cars aren't. And it's one of the most engaging cars on the road today and one of the most pure driving experiences you can get especially this side of fifty thousand dollars and it's easy to daily drive and maintain so i think the miata is an awesome car these have been my thoughts and experiences about owning it so let me know what your guys' thoughts are down in the comments below i hope you really enjoyed this video and i can't wait to see you in the next one